And we're back. Over to me this episode. Yep. Welcome to Abstractable. Uh, I'm Ryan. This is Lockie. And this is a podcast for people like us who are curious about the world and want to learn new things as we go. This episode, we talk about Let My People Go Surfing by Yvonne Chouinard. Yeah, one of our favourite books. So we talk about Chouinard's life from eating cat food and rock climbing to building a billion dollar clothing business. Um, We talk about quality of product and how to make the best possible product for your customers. And we talk about why following your values in business helps you find your people. So Chouinard's pretty old dude, so you can't really find him on Twitter or anything like that. But there's some excellent interviews you can look up on YouTube and one I particularly enjoyed on the NPR podcast, How I Built This. So we really hope you enjoy the episode. And we are back. We're in another new spot today. Yeah. Yet again. It is. a. This is the best spot yet. This is. Yeah, it's got plants. We're progressively getting worse or better. Better? <laughs> <laughs> it's got some greenery. It's beautiful. Got ahead of myself because yeah. I'm hoping that our remote recording is going to be just as good as this one now, yeah, mate. We've set the ben- benchmark. Yeah, we did one on the last episode. That was all right. So we'll see how good it gets once you're overseas uh what are we doing today patagonia let my people go surfing by yvonne chenard yeah this is one of my favorite books i'm just putting it out there i've got a lot of love for this book i'm a massive fanboy of this book (laughs) this was this was my favorite book from last year (sighs) mine too there you go number one so why was it your favorite it only really struck me as I was going back through preparing for this episode, just how much is covered in this book. It's mm. really, it's a, it's a story. It's a story of um, certainly a man's life, um, Yvonne, but also a story of building a great company, mm. a very almost contrarian company, yeah. you'd yep. say. And so much so that it's still defying the odds of what it means to be a company and what companies can and can do in today's world. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I was really looking through the notes. I actually got excited to read it again. So I'll probably do that uh, straight after this. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think I was going to go back it, to it. Yeah, I read it twice last year. It was bloody awesome. And it's unbelievable because Yvonne, the man who's um, still at the helm, 81 years old, he is, he is absolutely killing it. <laughs> Um, but he's very much an entrepreneur. Yeah. He's had an adventurous life. He has. He has. Tell us about it. Well, he was, he was born in 1938. Um, and so he's obviously now uh, he's ripe old age yeah. now. He's getting there. Um, and he, he started climbing, so rock climbing, very early on in his life. Um, and this was when he was about 14, 1953. Hmm. And... This was actually part of a falconry club. So, you know, people that train hawks and falcons, you know, to do particular things, you know, catch pieces of meat or... And rock climbing wasn't really what it is today. It wasn't really done by anyone, just the eccentrics. It was a pretty out there sport. Yeah. Yeah. And so as part of as part of the, the falconeering club, um, you know, where do, where do falcons nest? On cliffs. So, ah, yeah, it was a it was a requirement um, of being part of the Falconers Club that you know you're going to be able to go out there and find these things, catch a falcon, catch a falcon, yeah, you know? and then just land on your arm. Well, <laughs> not yet. It's interesting. Um, Don't you? But you'd have. Do you train them for that, or do they? Yeah. So they. Um, we just come back from uh, uh, the UAE, and we had a little um, Bedouin safari experience whilst we're mm. there and so they taught us a little bit about the the falconeering and um in order to to catch these things back in the day um and not a great deal has changed we've just become a slightly more sophisticated at it is they basically have some sort of dead animal um uh, usually a bird or a little little rodent type thing and they would have it catch it, have it on a string and be swinging, either swinging it around or sitting it on the ground and then basically trying to lure in these, you know, these hunting, hunting beasts. That's awesome. And then pretty well as soon as it hits the ground, they jump out on top of it 
you know, with a, with a blanket or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, then is this really extraction like process to try and train, train these, um, these falcons and it takes it takes quite a long time to to get them up to speed and they've got to be constantly feeding it to you know Mm. um, acquaint it with the owner but basically they they're very quick to kind of give up all allegiances and so if at the point at which um the falcon decides that it can get some more food somewhere else even after you know months and months and months of training um these things It'll just fly off, yeah, and won't come enough. back. And so it happened all the time. And these guys were relying on this this bird for their source of food. Really? Yeah. So this is this was like how they how they hunted when they're out out moving because they're very nomadic, moving around the desert. Jeez, that's really interesting. So life or death. Yeah. I don't envy the guys that have to have to do that. No. So they um, really took to rock climbing. Yep. Um, and. Uh, him and his mates uh, kind of enjoyed the rock climbing a lot more than the falconeering. So they ditched the falcons. They ditched the falcons and and basically um, started jumping on freight trains and trying to you know catch not catch the break but catch the cliff. You know, mm. uh, catch the best cliffs around the world and or well, certainly around the, sorry around the states. They were basically bums. They yeah. just travel around climbing and do nothing else, right? Totally. Yeah, it was yeah. totally, totally immersed in it. And super adventurous, like dangerous stuff. Yeah, very, very pioneering too at yeah. the time. Yeah. And so um, this was when uh, there was what they called um, soft iron pittens and they were basically the, the little spikes that you hammer into the, the mm. face of the cliff yep. to get your next vantage point like for the road. Like a big nail. Yeah, like a big nail. Yeah. Um, and you'd hammer these in and then leave them there. So because these guys were pretty out there, like they they were basically at the frontier of pushing this, this sport um, of rock climbing. They would do multi-day climbs. So they would, they would climb on a cliff for multiple days, a sleeping mm. mid climb, mm-hmm. um, whether on a little ledge or just hanging, hanging there. I, I can't quite imagine that. It's, no. Not, not on one of my bucket lists, but it gives you some insight just into mm. how, in, how into it they were. Um, and so obviously that becomes a costly exercise when you're a bum traveling around um, by freight trains looking for the next, the next cliff to climb. And so it led them to this idea of um, in collaboration with some other climbers and things to go, hey, let's just make these into hard iron picks, mm. uh, pittance. And so um, 1957, uh, he bought a second-hand forge. Um, you know, so he's 19, 19 years old uh, and learned to blacksmith, um, teaching himself and learning off others. Um, and as then, you do. Yeah, as you do. <laughs> and basically got to a point where he could forge a couple of these things per hour and he sold them off for $1.50 each. Yeah. And so what it meant is you could hammer it in and then yank it out. Yep. Reusable. Reuse it. Yeah. Good for, good for the economy, good for saving the wallet. Um, and off the back of this, you know, it was quite popular because people were very keen to have reusable spikes themselves. So he founded what was called Chunard Equipment uh, off the back of this, Chunard Equipment. But he was eating cat food. <laughs> so he, he built a small <laughs> shop out the back of his parents' place yeah. to, to sell these from. Um, and basically drove around in his in his car, in his station wagon, mm-hmm. with his anvil, his tools, and would go between surfing and uh, being at the cliffs, and then making tools in his downtime, um, all these you know the various mm-hmm. uh, rock climbing equipment in his downtime, and selling it off. But they were selling it off for a pittance. You know they weren't making yeah much money, and so he was eating. Um, there was cat food damage, but it was wasn't just cat food. It was a damaged tin of cat food. It was a damaged box of it. Yeah, it was wasn't a damaged it? box of all these tins, you know, din, you know, with dints in them. So yeah. he's able to get a yeah. cheaper price on the yeah. on them. Um, and he lived off that and oatmeal and a couple of other staple foods. It's for, probably pretty healthy. You know, like it's it's probably better than 
most diets now. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. That was an interesting food. thing in a book called The Blue Zones that they study the healthiest, the people who live longest, and they all are from really sort of low socioeconomic kind of areas, I suppose. Not in the way that we think. Maybe that's not the right word. Not like downtown, um, you know, in a major city where you see people who are less fortunate, but more people who live in... You're talking developing countries. Yeah, so, like rural yeah. areas with very simple lifestyles and very, very simple diets. So, And and where is the healthiest place in the... Well, there's six. Okay. Um, and it's pretty interesting because we should do this another time, but just to briefly touch on it. One of them's in Japan, as you'd expect. One's in Costa Rica. One's in Greece. Greece or Cyprus. Um, and there are another others that I, I forget. But the most interesting one is there's the Seventh-day Adventists in the middle of California live the long, longest in a country that is full of people who... Yeah, they've got an obesity epidemic. going epidemic. the other way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that would be a very good one to do on a podcast because it, it touches on kind of what I think is probably the only real way to learn about the way to live is through some sort of empirical study like that particularly around how to eat because it's so the body's so complicated. It's an area that's close to my heart, mate, so yeah. we'll definitely touch on that in yeah. the future. and you can teach me something. Oh, I could pass you on to someone to teach you something. <laughs> so um, things started going okay for the for Tunart equipment. So, so he's yep. at the forefront of this. Yeah. And he's, an, he's a pioneering climber at this time as well. He's not just like some bloke. It's such a small thing and, and he's pretty good at it. Well, they call this the golden age of, you know, the Yosemite climbs. That's what they refer mm. to this period as. And he's, he was on the, he was leading the pack basically or one of the leaders of the pack. Um, but he'd do some crazy stuff. Like he almost died so many times, particularly when he got into ice climbing. Uh, and still to this day, I believe, does quite a lot of adventurous climbs. Yeah, it's what's keeping him fit and healthy, right? Good luck to her. Yeah. And so, uh, as you said, in the um, just before the sixties, he hired some some of his fellow rock climb rock, rock climbing bums and uh, got them on board, and they all started you know pitching in to help help make some of this equipment just due to the demand. Um, mm. And in the late sixties, branched out into ice climbing, as you said, and wanted to kind of innovate that space as well in terms of. Um, the equipment that was on offer. So mm. um, they'd already had a good crack at the rock climbing industry and they branched out into the ice climbing. And he actually talks about this learning process too at that stage of the book where um, he was able to, to complement some of his rock climbing techniques and behaviours and from the ice climbing stuff that he was learning. Learn by comparison, as we've touched on. So interestingly... He actually wrote some books about ice climbing at the same time. So he wasn't just making the, the kit. He was talking about how to do it, you know, uh, and coupling those two things together. So he was figuring it out himself. Yeah, he was, he was this guy's on the bleeding edge. Mm. Yeah. Um, which, is, which is definitely a trend that he's, he's had across his entire life and continues to have. So by the uh, 1970. Shunard, Shunard Equipment was the largest supplier of climbing hardware in the US. So it's pretty pretty incredible growth. Um, mind you, a very niche sport too. So yeah. not a huge market. Um, and he'd obviously just recently gone into business with Tom Frost, a, um, who's an aeronautical engineer and avid rock climber himself. And, and you know, that was obviously off the back of them starting to really hone in on their craft and, and, and the quality they're producing. 71, he married his wife, um, Melinda. They've been married since. They've got two kids. Uh, and 1972 um, was when some of the big big changes happened. So this is where they, um, I think it was multiple instances, but there's one, I think one major instance of going back to Yosemite and they basically went to a, you know, one of the climbing spots that they've been going to for, for many years and um, basically saw 
what was once a beautiful cliff face being kind of picked out mm. by all these rock um, rock picks being hammered in and then yanked out and it was doing some massive damage to the to the mountain and for a guy that considers himself you know basically integrated with nature um, it, this this you know this hurt them pretty hard and so they they basically vowed at that point in time to phase out this this hardened iron pitten mm. which is the product that is basically that they're surviving on in terms their of their whole income, business their whole business yeah um, and for a memory he just bought a new a whole new setup to make these pittens when he was innovating the next step that you'll talk about yeah so he'd invested heavily in making that and basically invented something that completely ruined his current business it's integrity yes sticking to the values so as he was developing them probably yeah incredible and so what they what they did is they eventually landed on this product um, known as an aluminium chock um, which is basically a a, a hand wedged version um, that can be removed yeah. um, and you know the idea was to introduce this and and phase out the the iron ones yeah and he had to build up a lot of trust for people to actually use them because they didn't they trusted the pitons and you know if you're going to try this new technology when you're 50 meters up on a rock face you want it to work you know um and it's interesting because he you know what he's just talked about is like what disruption theory now is sort of teaches the big companies are supposed to do is not be afraid to cannibalize your own product before someone else does. <laughs> well, and particularly if it means that you're going to be the first mover in another space yeah. because you're brave enough to, to venture out there. But it's, it's not to say that these guys weren't building in the effort behind these products. Yeah, it wasn't just like, you know, putting a, licking the finger and putting the air and go, oh, those, you know, let's make it out of aluminium and oh. slightly bend it this way instead. Big skin in the game. Yeah. You know. He's climbing this thing with these new, <laughs> these new aluminium chocks he's built uh, that don't damage the rocks. You know, he's the one up there with them. So, well, that's that's the thing is they they are so heavily invested in their product that and it, it actually caused them quite a bit of heartache because they were concerned that people might perish as a result of their product, and so it was the highest importance to them, safety, you know, safety or well, functionality. Mm. And then you know, now, now creeping into the scene at this point in time here is, is now the environment mm. and doing good, doing good for the environment. So his first product was a, was a rugby top. Yeah. Um, but what I was going to say is on the chocks. So that was also the beginning of them needing to start their, their infamous marketing schemes. Now they don't market much, but if you haven't seen a you know a full page Patagonia magazine spread, um, certainly from back in the day, these were innovative things. You know, it's like it reminds me of some of the you know the Apple advertising, just big bold statements and getting mm -hmm. some really credible people on on board with what they're saying. So, um, and anyway, turns out that. After, after the result of, you know, pushing this product, they completely phased out the iron pittens and were able to bring on the aluminum chocks and they could not keep up with the demand. <laughs> it was insane. So then the rugby jumpers came along and this is where um, it was purely, again, out of, out of needing something through their own climbing mm. because this, this entire adventure the whole way was always just to fund the climbing mm. hobby. In fact, he actively said he was like an anti-capitalist almost, you know. Just, he didn't like business, business people. He thought they were all crooks until he realised he was one and then he said, well, I better figure out how to do it the right way then because I'm basically a businessman. I'm running a business. <laughs> and, and I think he still, he still sees himself that way. Mm. He's still trying to figure out how to get it right and how to move closer to that, which is – Remarkable. Mm. Um, so brought back this rugby jumper from some climbs he was doing with the rugby jumper because it's a super durable type thing. Friends were um, obviously envious, wanted their own one. He made a big, big order 
of them from England, I think, um, and some other places, um, which is kind of coincided with some other, um, other suppliers getting the same idea, um, some other retailers. And basically they sold out the entire global market of these rugby jumpers and, and <laughs> couldn't get it going. So they had to shift. And basically this, this became the inflection point for Shunard equipment um, to, to branch off um, into, into more clothing space. Um, and this is where, this is where we see Patagonia, you know, stem from. And they wanted, they wanted a separate company from, uh, from Shunard equipment just because they didn't want to dilute Shunard Mm -hmm. and they wanted to create something that was standalone and represented what this company was all about in the clothing, which is probably a good move in the end. Uh, and so the eighties saw them, um, become quite successful in the clothing range and this is where they introduced some of their vivid colors that Patagonia is known for uh, moving away from the forest greens and camels um, and then 1984 uh, Patagonia opened a cafeteria on site which is not super common serving only healthy food um, and obviously setting up a, a, a child care center at the same time so really starting to innovate in their businesses uh, 85, they shifted from propylene into, into polyester, which was a new thing at the time. Doesn't sound like it today. And 1986, this is where some of the big stuff happened from the environmental front. So uh, they committed um, to um, 1% of sales um, or 10% of profits, whichever was greater, uh, to go to these environmental causes. Um, 1989, um, now obviously... Uh, the, um, throughout this period, Yvonne handed over the reins um, to to some others to, to basically run the company, but he was still at the, the head. To run uh, Patagonia or? To, to run Shunard and to run Patagonia. Yeah. Yeah, Chris, Chris um, I can't recall her name off the top of my head right now. Um, but basically she took, she took that on board in yep. a big way. And... Uh, 1989, unfortunately, Shunard had to file for bankruptcy, but uh, Black Diamond Equipment was established shortly after. So Shunard Equipment, not Patagonia. Correct. Yeah, which is his original company. And Pat- because Patagonia was was continuing to, to grow some momentum. Yeah. Yeah, so he really uh, ramped it up and they were starting to get pretty popular by then. And rock climbing was a much bigger thing. Rock climbing was growing, you know, the, just outdoors the, the practical adventurer. the practical nature of some of this clothing because yeah. it started out just purely being for practicality and function within rock climbing but then people liked what it looked like and wanted to be able to just became wear fashionable. these things around so it became fashionable and you know they started building this brand behind it um you know shortly after that that big um uh, environmental pledge they then also they thought they were doing quite well some other companies were getting on board so they decided to up the ante and basically commit every single year regardless of profit or not one percent of sales so a lot of money and they've maintained that uh 1996 switched to or, or completely organic cotton off the back of a a self um a self-commission inquiry into their business practices and seeing what environmental impacts the company was having and you know, at this point in time, the world didn't realise just how much impact cotton was making um, environmentally. Um, and we're only starting to see some companies switch over now. Uh, they were looking at solar panels. 2001, he launched uh, 1% for the Planet Program, which is basically a, a company of companies that get together and um, you know, pledge for all these, you know, uh, all these donations to be given and, and places to put the donations. And basically since then, they've continued to do what they do and Mm. bigger and bigger focus on environmental activism, um, focusing on grassroots environmental organisations, making impact. Um, They moved into like restorative agriculture, agriculture which revitalises land rather than Mm -hmm. taking from it. Um, And now they've become politically politically engaged, which... I'm not surprised. Yeah. And he's, this is something he, he dislikes. He, he wishes he, that they hadn't, but he says we had to because mm. it's the only way we can now you know, get these evil people out of our government, which is <laughs> quite, a quote from him. Um, and I think they're actually suing Trump at the moment for, for something. Cool. 
just line it up with these other lawsuits uh, impeachment and, and i think so i think the i think across um their lifetime 105 million dollars donated to 650 organizations wow. in these you know, environmental organizations that's huge it's amazing and they continue to grow in popularity so what is it about this book that grabbed us so much besides Shannard's very unique personal story i guess the the major standout for me across the entire thing was sticking to your values and producing something of quality. Yeah. That's just, that shines all the way through everything that goes on throughout this book. Yeah, I think for me, it, along the same lines but slightly different, is that the idea that you can get something doing the right thing by your values, whatever they may be, and having an opinion and, and really backing that in no matter what is good for business, you know? And that's quite contrarian. Uh, and we'll get, we'll get through that talk. And, you know, I've got some stuff to talk about that throughout the episode, but to me that summarises, you know, what this book's about. It's, it's just a completely different way of thinking. And they were some of the first to do it. Mm. But do you think it's, it is that contrarian though? Because I think what he was, now it seems contrarian in terms of the actual outcomes and what he was fighting for. For, a, for a business, mm. I think it's very contrarian, particularly when he did it. But I'm interested to hear what you think about that. Yeah, I totally agree. And particularly for the time. Um, but it's interesting because he is really f honing in on a niche customer. There's a particular customer that's going to get on board. Mm -hmm. Now that customer, the prevalence of that particular customer, I think has grown as society's kind of progressed in itself. Um, you know, people becoming more environmentally conscious and um, focused on these things now. But it's so interesting how he, he wanted to provide the best thing possible for his customer whilst maintaining his values. I think that's a really important point because to me this only works because he's building a super high quality product. So people are willing to pay for that and the story that comes with it and what it means. Um, otherwise, you can't make widgets that are of poor quality and have this kind of altruistic stance I don't think it, I don't think it works but um, there's yeah the two pillars of what he does is he makes the best thing he possibly can and puts that first no matter what and he puts everything into making it better he is a craftsman and he's built a company full of people like that in fact it says you know he said that that is the number one thing for them period you know um and as that quality goes up, he also raises the bar on how he backs in his values. So he's got a very specific philosophy. And as he makes better stuff and people like it, he also raises the bar on how far he backs himself in on those values. And as both of those go up, they reinforce each other and keep going up, 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 up. And it's interesting, he didn't start this way. You know, that's one of the really great things about reading this book too is that he just iter iteratively got better and better at doing these things and made a lot of mistakes along the way. He didn't just start Patagonia and he's like, I'm going to put these values in and we're going to head in this direction. I'll donate this and that. I'll give these flexible working hours. No, he kind of, he worked that out over time. So now it looks like this fully formed thing, but, um, which it is. It's been a long journey. But yeah, he started it. What'd you say? 1957. So, you know, that's a long time ago. Um, the very first really started knocking out pitons. Yeah. Well, the, the, you know, something that was causing environmental damage and it was simply enough to, you know, to shake him and to say, you know what, that is something that we will not stand for in yeah. what we're doing. So The fact he didn't care too much about money meant he could get a lot of it too. So yeah. that is a concept that... Is, is interesting to reflect on. Profits have always been 
certainly not primary. Um, and he's there to, like, don't get me wrong, he's there to make money, right? He's not running a charity, but it, he, the profit's the outcome. So let's but dig they've, in. they've also traded off, you know, profit in place of the environment many, many times, you know. But you could argue that that's... In the pursuit of profit. I wouldn't say that. I, I'd probably word it differently and say that that is actually a decision that he thinks is both the right thing to do by what he believes and is going to make him more money because he knows in the long run that that formula brings more success to the business. He yep. just can't calculate it. See, I think that's that's where you've struck the chord is the long run. Mm. Whereas when you're in the moment... I suspect, and certainly when some of these things were happening, I think it would have been a trade-off for profit, you know. They, it, it, they wouldn't have seen some of the, you know, the movements that we've seen behind particular companies now. No, you know, no. That didn't exist. They no. were creating that. Correct. And, and, and that's where I think you're right in terms of the thought of like, hey, he's not thinking about the money as a first-order thing it's like a second order outcome so mm. he prob- he probably doesn't really care if he makes more money but he kind of knows that it's prob- over time that he will because he's doing this but he doesn't know for sure so it's kind of you've got to kind of to follow this philosophy you've kind of kind of give up that immediate kind of wanting that feedback oh is this going to work is that not it's like no nah, I'm doing it because this is our direction you know yeah, stop chasing the quarterly returns mm. and look for it. Just gaze the eyes up just a little bit further. Which is, it's hard to do that. Oh. It is, it's not just through greed. It's the unknown. That's, that's tricky. Um, it's good to note as well that he, he was early on in something that grew a lot. So environmental factors helped him. But he was certainly one of the best he was the best at, at what he did. although the North Face fella who he's friends with, um, it, they did pretty well too. And interestingly, that guy and his wife have bought huge swathes of rent, land in South America and converted them to national parks. Mm. Yeah. Someone needs to. <laughs> really unique, some of these, these companies. So, Well, I think, I think it's really important to, to highlight um, just how focused on quality what they were. So yeah. the... Um, there's a quote in the book which is make the best product is the raison d'etre and which is like French yeah. dropped it in <laughs> threw it in yeah and soon you'll be doing this episode in French I, I, I won't even understand you're going to have to give me some serious time to get there right? <laughs> I'm going to get pulled up on the pronunciation of that get Google Translate out which, which is which is the purpose that means mm. the purpose um, for those that missed my poor pronunciation I needed that. I didn't know what it meant, but I've heard it before. Yeah. I always just nod the, and say, yes. The reason, the reason to be, I think, is what I'm smart and know what that means. <laughs> yeah, I'm yes. on board with that. Yes. <laughs> and so um, there's a big guiding principle uh, that stems from um, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, um, which is a French aviator. And mm-hmm. basically the crux of it is um, in anything at all, and this is a guy that basically – innovated aviation and came up you know with mm-hmm. the the refined version of what the airplane wing is that we we know today um, which is quite a beautiful teardrop looking shape on its side uh in anything at all perfection is finally attained not when there is no longer anything to add but when there is no longer anything to take away when a body has been stripped down to its nakedness and i think that is mm. I think Patagonia as a brand, or at least what I know of Patagonia as a brand and the, what I've seen of their products, that really speaks to that, that guiding principle. Yeah, they're like really utilitarian products that are made for a purpose. They're not made for fashion. And I think that he said he got caught up in that in the 80s when they were booming that, and they had all these issues because they were growing too quickly and people started to see it as a fashion brand, which I think is happening again now when I walk around Melbourne. Um, But so they went back and said, we're not making anything fashionable. If that's an an outcome 
that's additional to the function, great. But this thing has to work for its intended purpose and that is its first order. Absolute must. Another quote that he put in the book from someone called Richard Buckminster Fuller, who I'm not sure who it is, but it's a great quote. Um, when I'm working on a problem, I never think about beauty. I only think, I, I think only how to solve the problem. But when I've finished, if the solution is not beautiful, I know it's wrong. So simplicity in design is one of his big driving forces. Yeah, it comes back to, comes back to that, you know, the teardrop looking aeroplane wing. And it's a very natural, beautiful type shape when you do look at it. Um, it's in its purest simplicity and it's, it's, it's almost like in this naturalistic type form. So this is kind of product design. I'm not sure how this matches with the kind of organic that we see, you know, and the idea of, because sometimes things that evolve aren't that streamlined, you know. Or well, perhaps they are in the end, but, you know, you, not a lot of things look like the aeroplane wing in nature. And I'm thinking, and then you kind of think about like a Gaudi church, the Gaudi church. Or, you know, that is a intricate, complex thing that makes you think of a tree almost. Uh, so I'm not sure you should shoot for this kind of perfection, the, perf the, perf the simplistic perfections at the end. When you're finished, I don't think it's during necessarily. Mm. I don't the think process, you ever get there either. Yeah, and the yeah. process of refinement that he's talking about is because that's where I get stuck. I start doing something. I'm like, well, it's not, it's not beautiful. It's not right, you know. Whereas that's where you should be reflecting later. I think I'm having this realization now instead of at the time going, oh, it's it's stuffed, you know. I can't do it, or it's it's not perfect because. See, I think, I think Fuller's, Fuller's quote there is it's very much a, that's like the ultimate outcome. You know, it's the ideal outcome. That's what we're, we're striving for is that, you know, the simple beauty. Because at its core in, in nature, um, your, you know, a, a particular species of something is looking to exert the least possible energy to keep up with the change of the world around it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that often means a minimal, simple type form. But the first iteration of anything is going to be ugly. That's the hard bit. And that's, that's what's hard to keep in mind. Yeah. And he actually goes through this and, and it's interesting to go through. Something I want to touch on though is that he keeps his focus very narrow. So he'll only make a certain amount of things and it c keeps him really, uh, I suppose, accountable to those things. Um, and he uses this same philosophy in his marketing. But really, and we, we've seen that with some of the other, we saw that with Jiro. It's going to come back to Jiro. And the quality aspect is like, make a few things really well, it makes you really accountable and it gives you a lot of iteration. So if you're going for high quality, don't have 50 menu items, <laughs> go for the Jiro model. One, You'll get, one, one cuisine. But it's like, but it's like, that's like super high risk too, you know? So maybe we're looking at the winners, but I think that generally you're not gonna make anything really amazing if you're trying to do too much once you know yeah and i think that um quite often what will happen in some of these companies particularly when they start you know branching out into other products and things is there being something that they're not you know mm. they're, they're starting to be something which they may not necessarily be and um they get into trouble and they get into trouble so going back to so his simplicity quotes in the peeling way but he'll he'll he released a few of the innovations, say these synthetic fibres he used and that sort of thing or his business used. They released them before they were perfect and then kept, kept going. So he won't wait until he's crafted the most wonderful jumper. He'll still put it out there if it's on the cutting edge to get ahead. 
Um, and but, but they also invested so much into research. Yeah. You know, they were they would just look at, be constantly on the look. They would be at different conventions for even slightly unrelated things. Now, this is – I'll read you this. So, like creative cooks, we view originals as recipes for inspiration and then we close the book to do our own thing, resulting in designs – uh, like a fusion recipes from the best chefs. So he says that's innovation versus invention. So he steals from others and other and other domains, which is something we talked about in range. He doesn't want to invent something from scratch. He wants to take uh, two different things from different areas and put it together for a new purpose in a different one. That's, that's the way to go. And as the, the old saying goes, mate, stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, you might as well. Yeah. Why, why waste all the time starting back at zero? There's been so much that's come before. So I used to, well, I still do, build a lot of spreadsheets so, for work or programs for like a schedule for how long something's going to take or whatever. And I would build this is, these. This is engineering talk again. Hugely <laughs> intricate thousand formula sheets with macros and programming in it and I thought that was awesome and that was the way to go but I was just making it over complicated and they never worked and that if they did they'd only work for a short amount of time I'd spend more time fixing them I was going to say you spend more time making the thing and then more time maintaining the thing to try and make it account for all these different examples whereas you could build a quick little simple version of it each time Mm. and do a better job. And I've try, had to force myself to start doing that. And I I'm, found, I'm hopeless for this. So often you'll, I'll have to present like a timing schedule to a client or something like that. And I've been in meetings with consultants where they bring out a thousand line program and it, oh, everyone goes, oh, you know, that's wow. And I've sat in meetings reviewing them and I'm just, this is nuts, you know. It's completely useless. It has no value for what it's supposed to be intended for. But maybe they built it. Maybe their intention was to build it for the meeting. So I've to try and do the exact opposite and make the simplest thing now as I can. And it's hard to go into a meeting and show something, someone that because only a few people get it and they're the ones that have built something. Yeah, it's almost, <laughs> in, yeah, in some of those meetings, it's almost like we just want to see some effort, you know, for, for what's been done. So, therefore, you need to have lots of stuff here. But yeah, it's the equivalent of walking around quickly with a clipboard, you know. It doesn't actually provide value. So, I think that uh, it's been super interesting to notice some of the most the best operators I've worked with aren't afraid to go into somewhere and, and seem like the dumbest person in the room and ask the dumbest questions. And that was something really interesting that I noticed hanging around with a few quite successful people on some of these large projects. So kind of plays into this in a different way. I think about um, certainly in that space, right, the... The level of kind of detail that you go down to is something that you can, you know, accurately measure or accurately get an understanding of. And if you're, you know, in this case, building a timeline for, for a project down to every single little task, including um, someone doing some surveying and someone you know, hammering in some metal um, nails or something, how do you actually know that we're even going to be using nails? How do you actually know that we're actually setting yeah. this out in the first place? I, I like just, where is this coming that's from? That's right. I was in a meeting. You don't need that granularity when you don't know, when you're making all these assumptions. Yeah. I was in a meeting just before Christmas and I actually showed a program like this to a room full of people and half of them were um, the type that built a long one and the it only took me like 10 minutes to go through it and they're, they're like, is that it? You know, ju really judging me. And I know they walked out of that room going, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Did you call him out? 
Well, they didn't. They didn't call me out, so I didn't call them out. No, but my client was happy. Mm. So I don't care. But <laughs> it's just really interesting. So this break is- the rules. And don't don't build complicated spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> and and if you are building one, someone's probably already got one, and you yeah. could probably just find it online. I've also found that in the past. Really, jeez, I should have done that. So he's a rebellious guy. Yeah, he didn't want to be a businessman, so he decided to do it his way. Uh, he said he read all the books from all over the world about the different ways of doing business and picked out the best stuff. He didn't really read the American ones he didn't like it. Um, so he, cha- he breaks the rules. I think he basically invented content marketing 60 years ago. If he didn't invent it, he was one of the most prominent people that did it, um, where he'd all his advertising, sorry, all his marketing is basically his whole goal is to get people to learn who he is. By him, I mean Patagonia, and to teach them something. And then, sec- and also third, to show his products. But it's certainly he wants to. His whole goal is to like get people to know who they are, and that brings him additional accountability because they've got to be who they say they are. And so again, lumping on the accountability onto him, his himself and his employees, so that they align with the values. Yeah, and he and you know so putting it out there. And then acting in that the, the same way that they're preaching, um, and they are, and then they almost double down on that by calling themselves out on the fact that they're doing that, and that you know, and trying to preach that everyone else should be doing it too. And mm. I think that's great. So we taught people about layering in the outdoors uh, once they released their first thermal underwear, as an example of that. And his main source of, um, I suppose, communication was in these catalogues that he made and they didn't have glitzy models and stuff. They had pictures of people climbing and doing all these things because that's who they were. And as you were saying in the intro, he's not afraid to have an opinion. So he, the business will take a stance on things. You won't see this wishy-washy media release comes out from most people. Um, They have an opinion and what that has the, the effect of doing is that the people who don't agree, they they go elsewhere. The people, but the people who do, they love this brand because of its authenticity and it's just like them. So he attracts the people he wants as customers and pushes away the rest, and they and they uh, just have such alignment. Yeah. Well, <laughs> instead of trying to please everyone. The, there's a classic, classic example um, of this uh, where, and just just to speak of how how strong their brand their brand is, um, because of their uh, advocacy for environmentalism um, and the planet, um, they, you know, they're obviously of the perspective that population growth should slow down, um, and so they became act. Uh, advocates for um, you know family family planning services and and, and organisations. So anyway, um, there was some big action. Now I think this was back in two thousands or the nineties as well. So you know fairly early on, um, and there was a it was the Christian Action Church or something like that. The CAC they are called and. Um, they basically um, threatened to uh, picket fence uh, Patagonia's offices and their factories and basically stop their production. Um, and so in true uh, Patagonia fashion and Yvonne Chouinard fashion, they decide to think about, the, think about how we can take this and use this to our advantage. So... What ended up happening is they said, sure, you guys come and pick at our factories and come pick at our office, but for every person that shows up, we're going to up our donations to 
the family planning organisations, you know, and give per person. It was like ten thousand dollars or something, you know, but, quite a significant amount of money. And it's called Pledge a Picket, I think. <laughs> I think it's actually an organisation that that's awesome. exists. So there you go. And not a single person showed up. And shortly after, the entire campaign against these uh, the, the family planning um, uh, organisations was dropped. There you go. That's power. Reverse psychology there. Um, so some of the other stuff they do, Let My People Go Surfing, this is the title of the book, they give flexible time to everyone. If the snow's out, you go, you go skiing, you know. There's no pressure to be there. Um, I'm pretty sure you can sort of wear what you want. Um, you just can't go if there's an important meeting. You've got to be a responsible adult, you know. If people are relying on you, you've got to be there. But you can manage your own time, you know. Get what you need done. See you later, you know. Well, they're, they're very much about trying to create a, a more family culture and environment. Yeah. You know, that's from the, the early action of childcare centres. It's from supplying good food and, you know, just – these things, that you, services that you don't really think of hmm. or typically associate with the traditional, more traditional type companies. Yes. Um, Which is changing. It but, is changing, yeah. Uh, and then things is, things like yeah, all the donations, the way he approaches marketing is very different as we discussed. Um, the outward kind of, uh, I suppose, philosophizing and putting your philosophy into the world is something that he does. Uh, and that's paid real dividends for him. Uh, and so he loves to break the rules and do things differently. And uh, he attracts people that want to do the same. Yeah, he, he says, you know, hire, hire good people and just get out of their way. <laughs> he says that is the best way, the best way to, um, to manage. Yeah, and good on him. And so I actually watched a, a recent interview from him. I think it was the start of last year, start of 2019. Um, and this this summarizes just his mentality to you know being a, he's a rebel at heart, which is life is a lot easier if you try and <laughs> life is a lot easier if you try to break rather than conform to them. He's talking about <laughs> rules, and so life for me has been pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what a unit. And, and so that's a bit of a throwaway, but you get the idea. It's a throwaway, yeah. yeah. And um, <laughs> it's a bit of tongue in cheek, but but it really epitomises the way that they thought about yeah. things. You know, so back when they were kicking off, um, there's one where they were starting to you know, import a lot of raw materials for their these pins. You know, they remember the iron pins that they were mm. they were building, mm-hmm. and so what they worked out is it would cost them, you know a tenth or just nowhere near the amount of money that was costing him to import metal, um, these metal iron products, mm. as if they were importing scrap metal. So what do they do? They throw, you know, these tons and tons and tons of um, pins into vinegar overnight or for a couple of nights. <laughs> rough Looks them up. like scrap. Yeah, they, they pull them out, leave them for a few days, and all of a sudden you've got these, you know, wrought iron looking bits of scrap metal, throw them on the ships, cost them nothing to, to import, and then they give them a quick polish and oil up at the other end, that sell them off. Beautiful. Smart. <laughs> That's just smart. Yeah. So I think, yeah, coming back to kind of my take away from the book, um, yeah, he, he just does things that don't make traditional sense for your business but aligns to his values. And that, again, attracts the the right people. So I think for every position at Patagonia, I think he gets 1,200 applicants. That's, um, that's big. So I wonder if it's got cut into, but I think partly something you said earlier was interesting where you said, you know, he got onto this environmental wave. What if his opinion was about the opposite to Planned Parenthood? How much success would he have had? Is it, is it partly because the opinion that he had grew in uh, popularity, got more widely accepted. That's very interesting. I, Is there a risk that if you don't think something that's, you know, really acceptable? See, I still, I still think that the, you know, 
what whatever your perspective on that the yeah you know, there's still going to be that that advocate for the uh, the christian whatever they are community and you yeah. know those those people will get on board with, you serve with whatever those people. Yeah, those people they are your niche yeah you just probably can't oh. become patagonia but you're going to be all right it's the thousand true fans i suppose made me think of the insane clown posse right and I how, don't know it. Oh, so they're these two guys from like outback America who painted their faces to look like clowns. They look a little bit like it's kind of like a kiss kind of look. And they do these terrible rap songs. Uh, so oh. They're shockers. Um, I thought you were going to say they're, like, they're the real life jokers. <laughs> it's kind of weird. And um, anyway. They, this band got made a lot of fun of, you know. Um, it became a bit of a, like, you know, the mainstream thought it was a joke. But a certain portion of the population loved it and they formed a group called the Juggalos. And the Juggalos meet every year and it's a phenomenon. And it just got me really interested in, like, um, these kind of niche cultures, like the My Little, the Bronies, the My Little Pony the guys that like My Little Pony, have you seen that? I've got a few more for you if you want. So this is I got your, into this. This is, this is your Saturday night listening to the, to the Juggalos. <laughs> and then I, I just got interested in like why these really extreme, I don't think they're extreme in the sense like they're not terrorists. They're just like really things that aren't normal, normal. I'm doing air quotes, as Adam Robinson would say. Um, why does that exist and why is it happening so much now? And the conclusion I came was like it's got to do with the internet, a lot of it, um, but it's also got to do with not being accepted and finding people that are kind of like you, you know? Um, yeah, I think if you have a genuine interest, someone else in the world is going to have that interest. Yeah. You will find people out there and the internet has just been the vehicle to allow that to happen at a global scale mm. rather than you being the little village idiot stuck in your own village and everyone thinks you're an outcast. Yeah, because you're like my little pony. That's fine. <laughs> just, uh, just don't say that around this village, mate. Yeah, but I think some people get pretty worked up about the insane clown posse and think it's like a really kind of uh, horrible dangerous thing but I, I couldn't see that when I looked into it I, it seemed kind of strange to me but it I just looked like it must be threatening for some reason or it might be scary or something like that. Nature. it is it's like a kind of like a horror style yeah. thing well yeah. it's that once you're in that space you're starting to verge into you know well what other things around this around this topical area can we get into what other niche cultures can we create out of this and we start moving into dark maybe darker and darker spaces well That's, yeah there's certainly things that yeah exactly and, there's and things that are less innocent yeah, there's definitely. this idea of the slippery slope you know and once you once you kind of edge so, your way a little bit too far what across do you the think slope, about the slippery slope as in is it a thing is it a thing yeah i think the i think the slippery slope Do, I, I does like playing it, Call of Duty make you want to kill people? No. Well, let me ask no, you that. No. Okay. I don't does smoking so. marijuana make you want to do heroin? No, but I think, I think, so I think you may be missing like some of the iterations in between. So it's about finding where the slippery slope is. Uh, so but, a, but, but I think, I think dealing in things that are addictive, like uh -huh. you know, if you're dealing with a heroin, like a chemically uh -huh. addictive substance, versus, um, you know, a movement around a particular band, mm. you're, you're in slightly different That's spaces. interesting because what about killing a cat, then torturing a cat and then trying to, are you going to go kill a human? You know, like there's, I, I don't understand Well, I it. think you're already in a bad space. You know, Definitely. You're already, like, and, <laughs> hey, look, I'm not advocating this. I'm just putting some thought experiments out there. Yeah. Well, uh, it's, it's interesting, right? Because if you're in that, if you're already in that space... I think you've already you're yeah. on you're on some path. Yeah, you're already on a path. Because it was interesting talking to 
not talking to, sorry, watching the Defiant ones on um, Netflix that kind of connected in my mental network about this I, this kind of idea. I haven't seen it, yeah. And it's about the Dr. Dre and Beats and Jimmy uh, Iveen, I think his name is, who I didn't know beforehand, who's a record producer. And he started, got, he realised that people love he started to build a record label after producing a lot of these famous artists. He started to realise that people on the edges, that's what they love, you know. Music is something that kind of people want to be a little bit confronted by. So he signed like Marilyn Manson and Nine Inch Nails. And at the same time he signed uh, Dr Dre and a lot of these rappers who are saying you know, some extreme stuff on um, and both are extreme in different ways. But he kind of recognised that the Rolling Stones were extreme who are now like mum and dad head to the arena to kind of, you know, yeah, mm. Mick, you know. He's a respected figure. Um, not so much when they were growing up, right? So he's kind of, and he made a shitload of money basically keying into this. Uh, and that's the kind of fringe and people say things about that type of music, you know, where it's like, well, this leads you to this. It's a bad influence. So maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know the answer. It's just kind of an interesting thought. I, I, yeah. I I struggle with it, right? I, I think I, I struggle with the, the slippery slope. What I do recognise, though, is the the movement of a crowd, and a herd, you know, the herd mentality. And so as soon as there's enough energy for a particular direction in a group of people, you know, as soon as you've got the overall energy of that group has hit a point, you know, and it might be just three people out of 100, mm. but they're loud enough to get some people who are on the edge of moving just to shift across <laughs> with their energy. Yeah. And that kind of is is the wave of movement as opposed to, this kind of ethical boundary mm. of slippery slope. I think it's more about the, the movement of an energy of a crowd as opposed to the movement and energy of a particular philosophy. That's interesting. But maybe, maybe it's the philosophy that gets the crowd moving in the first place. We need to hire someone, <laughs> psychologist or something. But I think I need to go. I'm going to look up the, uh, I'm going to keep looking into the insane clown posse stuff. I'm not sure I got to the bottom of, what I think about that. So. Let me see what you dig up, mate. You might end up in the uh, the dark web. Uh, oh, I, don't, I hope not. Um, so Patagonia. <laughs> That's a decent tangent. But, you know, to get back to what we're actually talking about is kind well, of... Talk, talk, talking about a movement, mate. Okay. Right? And, and I think it's important it is because, a movement, because yeah. Patagonia is, is a movement. Yeah, it is. So um, much so that um, I mentioned earlier on that they've now moved into this political space and they're suing Trump. Um, I think it's first something to do with invading particular, um, you know, restricted wildlife zones and mm. something to do with giving companies some sort of payback for something. You know, it's like, so Patagonia got $10 million out of it. They gave it straight to their environment. They said, we are not taking any of this and gave it straight to their environmental fund thing, you know, the company, right? But as a result of the legal action that they are taking against the, the president of the United States, they um, obviously riled up some of the conservatives over in the States mm -hmm. and there was a, a movement started Ooh. to boycott Patagonia. Right. Well, that's only going to help. Right. And so, and, and, you know, there was some big, big names behind this or sorry, big names over in the, in the, conservative party of us and you know they've got some some big power and so they were going to have this big launch day where we we're going to need to completely boycott patagonia i think it was like one day you know no one, what happened <laughs> day of the launch sales <laughs> went up by 600 oh. percent and that yeah. if that's not brand reputation that is a f i don't know what is that is a fantastic uh, example. So can I hit you with a few quotes to finish the uh, sort of summary of the, the book? Hit me. All right. So 
In the mid-1990s, four people were arrested in a protest to save California's headwaters from a forest. California's headwaters forest. They were part of Patagonia's intern program, which allows employees to leave their jobs for up to two months to work on an environmental group and still receive their Patagonia paychecks and benefits. So the very fact that aren't we are talking about this is a positive outcome for them from something that had no clear payback, I think, paying these guys to go off and do this thing. You know. We are a product-driven company. That means the product comes first and the company exists to create and support our products. And at Patagonia, at Patagonia, making a profit is not the goal because the Zen master would say profits happen when you do everything else right. And the last one, every time we've elected to do the right thing, it's turned out to be more profitable. This strengthens my confidence that it was the right thing to do. The way I see the entire mentality is it's the direction in which they are heading seems to be towards greater outcome for the entire ecosystem. And I don't just mean the environmental ecosystem. I mean the, the Pat- whole the Patagonia? business, Patagonia, societal, mm. environmental, all the ecosystems community. coming together, yeah. the entire community of ecosystems. And it seems that they want to push that in the right direction. They obviously have an environmental, a bigger environmental lens, but it seems that heading towards that kind of natural natural synergy between all these different things is where they're trying to push things and I think it has served them well. So tell me what you're going to do differently because of this book. I did say I'd come back to it. So Chris Chris Tompkins, now she was the lady that took over um, running Patagonia and, and Shunard. She was basically, uh, the quote was um, from from Yvonne, um, here's, here's Shunard equipment. Here's Patagonia. Do with them what you will. I'm going rock climbing. Because <laughs> he, he goes like, he goes r- rock climbing or something like, th- or he used to, three months a year. Just leaves the business. He goes, if it's burning down, don't call me. <laughs> you, I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, like, or you'll know what to do. Yeah, but, I'm going to do the same thing as you will. Call the, call the fire brigade. <laughs> <laughs> as someone who runs a roads and helps you know with two others runs a business that feels incredibly scary you know that and that that is also called a well-oiled machine mate. damn right it makes it a well-oiled machine doesn't it, it? forces it forces it to be well it's similar to what uh, tim ferris did it's like Quickies. letting your child ride off on the bike isn't it it's like yes off you you might fall over but off you go that, that's very interesting because that's exactly what Tim Ferriss did. He's because yeah. when he was in his late twenties, I think, or early thirties, in, in this very successful company, and he was you know burnt out to his last thread. But he was you know the, the company was doing extremely well, but he was you know doing eighty percent of the work. He said, "You know what? Cut it off here. I'm moving over to South America, and you're going to spend six months there or a year there or whatever it was, and." I am only going to be accessible for X number of hours a week and that's it. And so he had to make that work. The business ended up becoming more profitable. Get focusing, out of your own way. Focusing on making, making it a machine. Awesome. So for me, um, she took over the company. She didn't have a lot of business experience and she says, I started asking people for free advice. I just called up presidents of banks and said, I've been given these companies to run and I've got no idea what I'm doing. I think someone should help me. And they did. If you just ask people for help, if you just admit that you don't know something, they will fall over themselves trying to help. Wow. And that was very interesting. Wow. I, I'm not sure about you, mate, but you know, if someone came up to me with a genuine interest in wanting to find something out out that you know that i had some some expertise in let's say i think you would you would go out of your way to at least provide them a shift in the right direction or tell them where to get going definitely 
there'd be, you know, even if it's just five minutes, it would be unbelievable just how much valuable and insight you could provide just in that short amount of time. So for me, the big one, you know, have some humility and, you know, drop the ego and just mm. don't be afraid to ask for some more help because that's exactly what Yvonne um, and everyone else behind Patagonia did when they were getting going. It's really good. And what about you, Mark? Um, so I had a couple of things down. I read this a year ago, so um, I think I've done a few of these things and um, or tried to. haven't mastered it yet, but I think figure out the values you have and do the things that align with them, even when you can't calculate the results. Uh, care about quality and keep iterating towards it. I haven't done enough on that. I need to do more on that and uh, particularly more for that, for the product of our business. Yeah. And I had another note here, chase simplicity. I quite like the way that sounds. Chase after it. Uh, so I'm going to do that more too because I like to make things complicated. <laughs> yeah. it's you, you know that simplicity exists at the end of whatever it is as long as you're pursuing it in the... Uh, in the pursuit of quality and providing something. Yeah. That's, oh, um, that was good fun. Yeah. That's an, that's an exciting, exciting book. Oh, I'm excited after just talking about, it, I'm going to read it again. <laughs> <laughs> and he speaks quite well too. So um, yeah. definitely check out some of his interviews. There's there isn't much interviews. though, right? Uh, not a, there's not a massive amount, but he's, he's had some good interviews. There's yeah. the one I watched, um, where he's got that cheeky attitude still um, <laughs> and he gives a nice little insight into some of just the core values and you get some insight into what the guy is like. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Go out there and have some fun. That's it. See you later. See ya.